Coming at you from the AO Studios, it's the Fade Route with D and Z. Here are your hosts, D and Z. Powered by Riverside FM. Coming at you live from the AO Studio. AO. It's the Fade Rod with D and Z. I am D. We've got a great show for you tonight. Tom Brady broadcasting comes with some rules. Uh, Jason Dominguez staying in the minors. And football will be played in Brazil on Friday. Brazil. So we begin today's show, well, just in case you didn't know, the NFL season kicks off on Thursday. That means our ratings are going to start to go up because we all know everybody loves football. Let's fucking go! The reigning defending Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs take on the Baltimore Ravens in a stiff test to start the season. So now it's time to make some way to some early predictions. We've ordered them up, but who you got in the playoffs and in the big game? Yeah, so as we know... 14 of these 32 teams are going to make the playoffs. And of those 14 teams, only two will make it to the big game. And then once you get to the big game, only one will win. Now, we've ordered them up. We've we've discussed them. We've kind of made our cases and made our reasons. But I'll take it division by division. Oh, okay. All right. So... Chiefs in the West, one team. I like Houston in the South, one team. Give me the Bengals, give me the Ravens, and give me the Jets and the Dolphins. Dolphins win the division, Jets in second place. Somebody drug test this guy. (laughs) He's pissing hot. It's the first. first. You've been been talking to Joe D. (laughs) You've been talking to Hassan Reddick. What are you talking about? It's the Tuesday. Jets? He still had shown up. The, do you mean the New York Jets? Is that the team you're New referring Jersey Jets. to? The Jersey Jets. <laughs> New Jersey, New Jersey COVID. Jets. Yes. The one in the same. Now, like as you know, as I, wow. I'm on record saying that I don't think the Bills have done enough to to remain in the top spot. I think Miami is gonna clearly the Jets have though. Apparently, they have a better roster on paper than the Bills do. They do. Mm. They do. Is that construction paper? <laughs> I mean, we'll see if uh, duct tape in a dream is holding together Aaron Rodgers' leg. So we'll see. My man. But they really, you know, I- I'm not in love with the wide receiver core for the Bills. So, you know, only time will tell. But I, I got the Jets in. Second uh, second place wild card team. In the NFC, wow. you're looking at the Eagles. You're looking at Lions and Packers. I got the Bucks, and I got the Seahawks and the Niners. Niners win the division. There you go. That's way too early. Conference finals. Okay. Give me the give me the rematch. Give me Niners Lions. Yeah. Give me Chiefs Texans. And I'm thinking, <laughs> this is the year. C.J. Stroud. They are going to represent. So I got the Texans going up against. The San Francisco 49ers because I still do not trust Dan Campbell in a big game. I trust Kyle Shanahan just a little bit more. But once you get to the big game, all bets are off. So, as we've seen. So, my way too early prediction, give me the Houston Texans over the San Francisco 49ers in the big game this year. Wow. Wow. Um... (laughs) Well, we, uh, yeah, we pretty much, we have the same conference championship. Oh, I have the Texans and the Chiefs as well. Um, but if I had to say another team that I think is knocking on that door, I think the Ravens will be there at the end. Um, I also think, I also think the, um, I think... The Bengals will also be there in the end. There'll be another team competing. I don't believe in the Jets. Um, I think the (laughs) Dolphins, I think the Dolphins, it's hard to trust them if they have to go on the road to win a playoff game, you know, so I I can't put any faith in that. 
On the NFC side, yeah, I mean, I just think the Lions are going to get back there. I mean, they've got the recipe. They're hungry. Um, and uh, I do. I think the 49ers will be there, too, because I don't think there's a team. This is it. They're all in, right? They're all in. They've spent all their money. They've got all their players coming back. Uh, there's really nothing going to stop them but injury. And I think ultimately... I think that might be one of the things that happens is towards the end of the season, players might get broken down, people might get hurt, and they might have to go to Detroit to play in the championship game. Uh, I do, I, I, I don't know about the Seahawks, but I think the Bucks are going to surprise some people. I think they're going to put up some points, and I think they're going to play well. Uh, but ultimately, I do have the Lions getting there, and I have the Chiefs getting there. Mm. So I think it's the Chiefs and the Lions in the big game, and I think the Lions take it. I think wow, this is their. I do think this is their year. I mean, he's got them hungry. I mean, he's just Dan Campbell's a great coach. They probably should have won last year. If it wasn't for one or two coaching things or one or two plays that didn't go their way, they were going to be there. They were going to be representing the NFC, and there's not a lot of teams in the NFC that could really hurt their chances or stop them. So that's what I got. Um, you, you, that doesn't worry yeah. you, though, that uh, Dan Campbell hasn't learned his lesson? I mean, because Dan Campbell, effectively, his decisions going on fourth down, you know, just coaching with his balls instead of his head, essentially cost them a spot in the Super Bowl last year. So that, that doesn't worry yeah, I'm you. Hoping- I mean, I'm just hoping that it it cost him last year, and it and it makes him make better decisions this year. Um, and I just don't think there's going to be any real competition for them. I think the Packers are going to be good, but I think they're about a year they're they're a year away, you know, mm-hmm. um, just because they haven't played. I mean, the game they played against Dallas last year was amazing, but then they came up against short against the 49ers, so. I do think the Packers will be playing well too. I'm I'm excited to see what they're able to do. Um, and uh, no, I, I like Dan. I, I like how he gets his guys to come and play. They play hard for him. Um, they're they're going to have some adversity this year too with injuries, I'm sure. And they're going to be better for it. I mean, I think they they're hungry. They want to play the 49ers. They want to play the best teams. Um, they've just got to win. They've got to win the games they're supposed to win. Right. You know, and I think that's really important. It sounds silly, right, to say things like that. But sometimes, like, you know, you get the laughers and you got to put it to them. You know, you got to beat them. It can't be this whole. You can't, you can't lay down any week. No, absolutely not. And that's the thing that scares you about the Lions is that when it gets to the big moment, are they going to shrink, right? We've seen the Niners shrink in the biggest of moments. We've seen the Dolphins shrink when the lights are on bright. All these teams that are top echelon teams, we've seen the Buffalo Bills collapse. We've seen everybody except the Chiefs for the last. I mean, listen, it was they. It was fourteen nothing in the first quarter against the 49ers <laughs> in the Super in the in the NFC Championship game. They had them on the ropes. Yeah. You, you got to learn how to finish a team off. You got to learn yeah. how to put your foot on your opponent's throat and don't right. play with your food. Now, if Dan yeah. Campbell strikes me as the kind of person that learns from his mistakes. So, you know, I'm with you on that. I, I think that he is going to be better off. But when push comes to shove, I, I, I like the Niner roster just a little bit more, even though I have a good feeling about Jared Goff, a really good feeling about Jared Goff this year, considering the fact that he's playing and the Lions are playing the majority of their games in a dome. Like this is going to be something very interesting. So they could, if they can weather any kind of potential challengers, it could end up running through Detroit. And we know how good Jared Goff is at home. We we know how good Jared Goff is in a dome. So you know you, you like to think. And then what what do you ha- what do you have going on in the AFC? How did the Chiefs not? How did the Chiefs not get back there? What's going on there? So I just have 
the Texans manning up, nutting up, and taking it from the Chiefs. And the same is this going to happen in Kansas City? Or they are the number one seed. Kansas City is going to still be the number one seed. So Houston's going to go All in right, Arrowhead so go and in take Arrowhead. it from okay. them. The same way that Baker Mayfield almost took it from the Chiefs in Arrowhead. So he let's did. not forget that. Baker Deshaun Mayfield. Deshaun Watson, the, too. Deshaun Watson. Yeah. But the, CJ Stroud, he's got the heart. He's got the arm. He's got the team to do it. He's got the tools. He's got talent. It's Miller time. It's a, it's Miller time. All right. Well, in some rare Friday night light action for the pros, the Green Bay Packers and Philadelphia Eagles square off in Brazil. Still, uh, Hertz has a new weapon in Saquon, but lost Jason Kelsey this offseason. Meanwhile, Jordan Love got paid big time, highest paid quarterback in the National Football League. But who has more pressure on them this season, Love or Hertz? Oh, yeah. Seven. Love Hurts. That's a good team. That's a good name for a fantasy it's not team. A bad, it's not a bad one. It's the name of this show, right? Love it's the name of this Hurts. episode. So it's not too bad. Love not too Hurts. shabby at all. Nine and nine. That's it. Nine and nine gets you the bag. Just remember that, kids. 500 gets you the highest contract for a quarterback in the NFL. Now, I, that being said, with that target on his back, with that dollar sign on his back, I think Jalen Hurts has more to prove. Mm. I think Jalen Hurts has to show that he is the guy. I think it's very convenient to say, oh, Jason Jason Kelsey was making the protection calls. Jason Kelsey was doing all these things. Now's the time, right? Sirianni is saying that the Eagles quarterback is taking ownership he's taking control he's you know manning up and taking this offense he's becoming the leader that sometimes jason kelsey took from him right that spotlight as the leader sometimes jason kelsey took that from him i i want to see how it works i really do by his own admission he regressed right let's see what happens when he doesn't have Jason Kelsey to fall back on, when it's him making the checkdowns, making the corrections, making the, the calls at the line. I'm interested to see that. Jordan Love, it's still early. It really is still early in his career. It's his second year as a starter. Nine and nine. Yes, he has a better completion percentage, but... He's only played 27 games. He's only played 27 games. And that being said, he's only started 18. Jalen Hurts has the team that is supposed to be on the precipice of success, right? This is the team that has A.J. Brown. That's the team that has Devontae Smith. This is the team that has Saquon Barkley. This is the team that's poised to go head to head with the Niners and then ultimately go head to head with the Chiefs. Right? That's their goal. Jordan Love and the Packers, they are still one of the youngest teams, if not the youngest team in the league again. So they're going to have to prove it again. But there are more expectations on the Eagles and therefore more expectations on Jalen Hurts. Yeah, you know, for me, it's. It's hard because Hertz has accomplished so much, right? Yeah. I mean, this was a guy that was at Alabama. He's the starter. Tua comes in, wins the national championship. Next year, Tua goes to Oklahoma. Everyone said when he was in Alabama, he couldn't throw. He goes to Oklahoma, and he throws, and he throws well. He gets drafted by the Eagles, comes the starter first year. I think he gets beaten by Brady in the in the first round of the playoffs. Yep. And then the next year, he's back. He's in the Super Bowl, and he scores all. He accounts for all the touchdowns in the Super Bowl. Um, I think it's hard for us to say that, you know, he's got a lot of pressure on him because he's he's done well. He's had success. I mean, yeah, they faltered at the end of last year, but we won't really know why. What happened to that team that, you know, was going and was was really one of the best teams in the league and then all of a sudden the first eight or nine weeks of the season it just fell apart yeah. um but i think it's on jordan love i really do because 
He's got this big contract now. He goes into Dallas last year, blows the doors off of them. The expectation now is you're the highest paid quarterback in the league. You really should be getting to the NFC Championship game at the very least. You're going to tell me that the Detroit Lions are standing in your way? Nobody wants to hear that garbage. You're going to tell me that the Minnesota Vikings are... No, Minnesota Vikings are nothing in your division. The Bears got a rookie quarterback. So you should be winning the division. And then when it comes to, you know, getting to the Super Bowl, you should be able to compete high with a team like the 49ers because the Lions almost beat them. And you're supposed to be better than the Lions. Supposed to be, but they're not. That's the thing. Like, you're, you're taught... You're... What you're saying to me, it's not true. Well, I'm saying it because... If you're a person who likes, if you're a person that lives in the Midwest Mm -hmm. and you're an NFC North fan, your whole life, (laughs) the Packers have been better than the Lions. There's no way you're going to accept that, oh, okay, the Lions are going to stop us from getting to the Super Bowl or winning the Super Bowl or winning the division or or making the playoffs. No way, man. No way. We're We're the Green Bay Packers. It all starts and ends with us. And I think that fan base, too, is a lot more rabid and a lot more unforgiving than the Detroit Lions are. I mean, the Detroit Lions, they've, you know, they've, they've been, they've, they've had no wins. You know, they're up and coming. Like, if they were to take a step backwards this year, you know, no one would say anything. To, I don't think that people feel the same way about the Packers. And as regards to the Eagles fans... The Eagles fans always expect the Eagles to win the Super Bowl, but they've won a Super Bowl recently. They've been to a Super Bowl recently. They they, they just lost Kelsey, who is probably their best offensive lineman. They brought in Saquon, and I think people have high hopes on how that's going to work, but how is that dynamic going to work? You're going to be giving him the ball now on the goal line instead of Jalen Hurts? And what does that do for Jalen Hurts' game? So... Um, I'm not sure. I really do think love has a lot to prove. They both have a lot to prove just for the, for that specific reason you just said, like, what is this offense now? What is it? Is Saquon Barkley a goal line back? You're not paying him like a goal line back. You're not, you're not paying him like Mike Tolbert, right? Mike, you're not paying him like John Kuhn, but you're paying him to be a bell cow and bell cows get fed. But that alters the structure of your offense because guess who else needs to get fed? A.J. Brown needs to get fed. Devontae Smith needs to get fed. Your your team is loaded. It's stacked on paper. (laughs) The Packers are not. The Packers are not. Young, young. A lot of young kids. A lot of young kids. Dobbs, Watson. Yeah, absolutely. Like They have potential. There's a lot of potential on the Packers team. And they hit. They hit on Jordan Love. Right? So that's what I'm that's my thing. Like they're still going to be the youngest team in the league for a while. The more ready to win, the more win now team is the Eagles. So like you I mean Howie Roseman's been going all in shit since what? Nick Foles? Like since the, last, since they won the Super Bowl? Six, last, last six years. They've uh, they've made some moves that you know they're they're we're competing we're competing I mean they're they're off their offense is stacked dude. yeah like they have they have two number one receivers in Devonta Smith and AJ Brown they're they just got Saquon Barkley who was a former second round you know second pick in the in the, in the first round yeah they've got Jalen Hurts who's uh, a champion. And who can do it all. He can run. He can throw. And then on on defense, they can compete at a high level. They can shut people down. Their kicker is good. I mean, they have a great all-around game. And they're also in a division that's winnable. I mean, I really don't know what Dallas is going to look like. I mean, Zeke Elliott is their starting running back. Or Dalvin Cook. CeeDee Lamb just got there. Yeah. CeeDee Lamb just got just got there. They're going against Cleveland week one in Cleveland. That's not a favorable I, matchup. I don't know. I don't know. If they think they're just going to walk into Cleveland and beat Cleveland, that, no. they're going to. No. It could be a very painful Sunday 
for Dallas. That being said, they did. They were the division champion last year. Like that's all you need to know about the NFC East, man. Like they, they, the Dallas Cowboys, were not mm. not that dissimilar of a team. Won the division last year, and there was a huge choke job by the Eagles. And like you said, Eagle fans are unforgiving about that. They do have their Super Bowl to kind of rest their laurels on and, you know, cry themselves to sleep at night. But I'm sh- they're not satisfied. Why would you be satisfied? You're the team that's the perennial favorite, right? If not one of the perennial favorites in your conference to make it to the Super Bowl, to make it to the big game. You know, there's there's unfinished business there, more so than with Green Bay. Do you love brownies? Of course you love brownies. And if you're looking for delicious, gourmet, handcrafted brownies, then look no farther than Sweet Life Brownie Cup. Chef Tommy D and the crew offer a dozen delicious delights that you will crave. From the classic OV, to Dutch Apple, to my personal favorite cookie jar, Red Velvet, and many more. Check out their Instagram at SweetLifeBrownie underscore co for their Friday brownie drops. Every Friday at noon, you see what they're making. Or give them a call at 845-641-3043 and tell them a D&Z sent you. That's SweetLifeBrownie underscore co on Instagram, SweetLifeBrownie co on Facebook, 845-641-3043. Sweet Life brownie co. Because there's always room for a brownie. In other football news, Tom Brady is beginning his regular season Fox broadcasting career as an analyst, teaming with Kevin Burkhart as the number one as the number one announced pair. However, Brady's potential minority ownership of the Raiders may put severe restrictions on his new job. If you were Tom Brady, what would you do? I heard about all the restrictions and this is like, how is this how is he even gonna do this? He can't go to production meetings. Nope. He can't go to the other team's facilities. Nope. Uh, he can't interview their players. Nope. What, what, what? What are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> I, am I the only one who thinks this could actually be kind of cool? Because you can actually get a legitimate human reaction from Tom Brady. Oh, is that why you think it's going to be That's cool? The because one? it's going to be natural? Exactly. In the moment, off the cuff, Tom Brady unvarnished. That's the only reason why it would be cool because you essentially you effectively neutered his position right you've effectively well tom brady effectively neutered his own position by trying to purchase the stake in the raiders so it it becomes the case of you're doing this to yourself now if you were just just to go over yeah just to go over some of the things he cannot yeah he's not he's not permitted to be in the other team's facility Mm -hmm. and just in case people don't know Usually the week of the game, whoever's broadcasting the game, they go to the other team's facilities to talk to the stars and, and, and watch practice to see, like, you know, get ideas of what they can say during, during the games. He can't witness practice. He can't attend broadcast production meetings in person or virtually. He'd be subject to fines or even suspensions if he goes too far in criticizing game officials and other clubs. He's subject to the league's gambling policy. He's subject to the league's anti-tampering policies, permitted only strictly social communication with members of their clubs. Jeez. All this to own a piece of the Raiders. (laughs) I'm just throwing, I mean, I don't mean to throw shade at the Raiders, but all this to be a minority owner of an NFL football team. That being said, what's giving you, what's going to get you more money? What's going to get you more money? The Fox gig. So... I would say adios muchacho. I don't need to be the owner of the Raiders. I, I don't need to. Yeah. I don't need to be owner of that team, especially if it puts such a severe restriction on my ability to do my job and earn my money. Like that's a problem. That, that's a mm. major league problem. So like the the only cool thing that could come out of it is a legitimate human reaction in real time, a la Tony Romo. But Tony Romo, the difference between Tony Romo and Tom Brady is that Tony Romo is able to sit in all week and while it is like exuberant it's something that is based on a week's worth of preparation so, yes it is yeah so yeah you know I- i'm interested i'm you know, interested to see what that would be for tom brady but like if i was him 
like I would just do my job to the best of my ability and I when I'm done being an analyst then I'll buy a freaking stake in the team right the team will still be there well the only thing I'm going to say about that is is like Tom Brady could watch his own game film he doesn't need to go to the production meetings to do that so he's going to He's going to do what he always does. When he's preparing for a game, he's going to be looking at both teams. And but is he, he going to have access, his... though? Like, or is the NFL going to allow him to have access to all 22? I don't, it's game film, so I don't see why not. Why couldn't he have a copy of the game film? Because uh, if he's like stealing signals and stuff like that, Spygate, like the, it's probably like the whole that was the whole basis of Spygate. But he's not. Well, he the can't, game film, not going to filter information, though. The game film is only going to be showing you uh, end zone shots. Uh, of you're not going to see the sideline, so you only see. It's basically what he would see if he was playing that weekend. You're going to see the end zone shots and the personnel groups that that are on the field. So he'll be able to know like what they're going to do on third down, third and long, third and short, things like that. So. You know, these are things that I'm sure Tony Romo picks up, you know, when he's at practice. But Tom will be able to pick this stuff up when he's because he he, uh, I saw a video recently where he still has like all the scouting reports all the way back to 2001. He has them all in his office and he has like like what defensive coordinators like to call he has the you know the different player groups groupings. Uh, the key has all his call sheets, all the way back from two thousand one. He's got all the call sheets, ninety five plays, starred the things they liked. It's crazy. So I mean, he could tap into that because some of the coordinators that he faced like ten years ago are still around. Um, not all the players are still around, but I think he has a he's a knack for diagnosing plays and he has a knack for for knowing what defenses are going to do it just might hurt him on the other side of the ball um you know for for watching what what is that what is the offense really going to do here i know he can read a defense and i know he knows what they like to do but is he able to look at an offense and and particularly know what's coming or what they like to do and i think he's going to miss out on talking about the, the the things he talked about with players during the week that you know, Jim Nance and Tony Romo are going to be able to do. But it's an interesting uh, point of view that you put out there saying, you know, this will be something that he can offer that no one else could because he's not going to be privy to any information. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things that he'll be able to diagnose it in real time. And it's like he would have the same – he would ha- he has a higher level of knowledge than most common fans, obviously. But – he also would be in a similar position because he'd be watching it from the sa- from the sanctity of his couch, so to speak. So the same way that we w- we're watching from our couch, he'd be watching from the booth and in real time. That's very interesting. But you know, I wonder how that's going to affect his travel. I wonder if he'll even bother traveling to the city until like the probably, day or two before the game. I would say probably the day there's before. There's no point for yeah. There's no point for him to get there on like a Wednesday or a Thursday because. You ain't going to be able to go to the – because you're not going to be able to go to each team. So you might as well just really – I'll just show up. I'll just show up at the stadium a couple hours before the game. What would be interesting so, is if they flipped the script, if Fox actually flipped the script and had Kevin Burkhart go in and Kevin Burkhart be the, the color guy in that regard. Oh, so what I heard during the week, Tom, and then kind of, you know, like reverse roles where – Tom Brady's doing the play-by-play and Kevin Burkhart is actually going to be similar to the role that he had when he was with the Mets on the sideline where he was doing the, you know, the reporting, the sideline reporting. So it's a very unique position that Fox put itself into and Tom Brady put Fox into, but um, it does shunt Greg Olson down the the pecking order a little bit. And uh, it makes you wonder, does Fox regret doing that knowing that the these restrictions are so severe like would it, would fox would the network actually be saying fuck we really made a mistake here we, we had olsen who's decent to very good and he's he doesn't have half of the baggage that tom brady has 
Are, are we do wasting like, our money? Do you here? like Olsen? I'm not really an Olsen fan. Are you an Olsen he's fan? He's alright. I mean, yeah. he's alright. He doesn't really do it for me. He doesn't really do it for me either, but he is unencumbered. So it's one of those mm-hmm. things that, you know, like maybe there would be a little buyer's remorse, but, you know, we all assume that Brady's going to be really good at this. He better be really good at it for the amount of bullshit that Fox is going to have to deal with. I'm surprised that they think he's so good. He's going to be so good at it. I don't know what made them think that, you know. I think they're just hoping for a little uh, a lightning in the bottle, the same way Tony Romo was lightning in the bottle. I mean, mm. they pretty much, the, CBS hitched their wagon to Tony Romo, and they kicked, you know, they, they kicked Phil Sims out of the booth. And I like, I, I, I like, I like Tony Romo. Yes. I find him, I find it fun. He makes it fun. Tony Romo yeah. is fun. And you know what? This allows Tom Brady to a show. A lot of people don't like A lot of people don't like him. A lot of people don't like his commentary. Yeah, I can see Antonio it. Antonio Romero. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. To, I mean, Tony Romo, it wears on you. It absolutely does. The, oh, Jim, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a lot. Like, Tony Romo is a lot. Especially if it's a team that he really likes or a quarterback that he really respects. Like if Tony Romo doing Patrick Mahomes games, it's almost insufferable. Like you know, <laughs> dude, get a towel, man. Just get a freaking towel. <laughs> but that's it. The other thing, Tom Brady didn't sweat anybody. Like that's the that's the one saving grace about this. Tom Brady's Tom friggin' Brady. He didn't sweat anybody. They're like, yeah, that's wrong. That's ass. What are you doing? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so shut the fuck up. Next question. <laughs> that's right. I'm sorry. My my uh, the, the glint from my rings were in my eye. <laughs> Ring is plural. Hey there, NFL football fans. This is the lovely Rita Sanchez, a.k.a. your option football champ for the 2023 NFL season. I'm inviting you to join us for the 2024 option, where we pick the winning teams for each week's matchups and compete against each other to see whose picks reign supreme. Are you in? Head over to CBS Sports and search for the option 2024 league or hit the link in the bio on the Fade Route socials and join today. It's for free. Pick a witty name, some winning teams, and I'll see you out there for week one. Well, from the NFL to college football, as the New York Times reported that top-earning college players at Power 4 conference schools take in approximately $10.5 million a year, with quarterbacks making about eight hundred and twenty k. Thanks, Nil. <laughs> Is it game over for every other school, and how long can this sustain itself? Nil is that right. New York Times article is very, very good. If anybody has a chance to read it, it's really insightful. And just talking about how money is being dev up in college football and college sports, it's unbelievable how much money people have to just give it, basically just give it to the alma, alma mater because you want the football team to play better. Wild shit. Mm-hmm. We're living in the program right now. That's what's going on, with, yeah. except it's all legal. You know, this is blue chips, but it's all legal. Yeah, it's wild. It's, abs- it's the Wild West, man. And it, it's really disconcerting to know that uh, I make slightly more than a, a, a 19-year-old specialist would in a power four. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, that's... that's re- How about the backup Help quarterback? Me, I'm poor. <laughs> the backup quarterback on Texas is making less... I mean, the starting quarterback on Texas is making less than the backup quarterback in Texas. Oh, yeah. How crazy is that? How much is Arch Manning making these days? $3.1 million. And I think Ewers is making one point four. It's absolutely insane. Which is weird. It is, it's weird. Like, it just pres- it presents a really diff- a difficult dynamic. And I don't... I don't think they real. I don't... I don't think they realize the damage they're doing because college is about to become the NBA, right? It's where even if you're a B player, you're making big bills. And the problem is, is like, you're just going to get to an area where it's like, hey, man, if you don't give me the money I'm looking for, I'm not playing. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to play at a high level. And then it's like, what are you going to do? These are 18 and 19 year old kids. Like, I mean... Think about like when we were 18, 19, if we had that much money and the, the attitude we'd have and how we would feel about ourselves. Oh my God. I mean, how is that getting toted around in the locker room? Like, how is that working out? 
you know, are you giving players, are you giving, are you personally giving linemen like $10,000, $30,000 if they protect you really well on a given day? Like, is that shit happening? Getting the Rolexes? I don't know. Like, how is that way really now? Like, if you're a center and you're, you know the quarterback's making three mil, I'm like, dude, you better throw me some money or I'm not protecting your ass. Right? Yeah. Like the How's this going to work? I don't know. It's, it's not. Eventually, it's got to implode. You, you figure that these numbers are going to get way too out of hand, especially like like Texas. What are the actual what are the actual championship expectations for the University of Texas football? Not much. Not much. They're expected to be good, but it's Georgia, it's Alabama, it's Michigan. Texas maybe maybe will come fifth in that conversation. And they're shelling out all this money to Arch Manning and Quinn Ewers. Right. And Ewers, it's like, shit, if I, if I knew I was going to make less than my backup, I would have stayed at Ohio State. So, you know, it's one of those things that this is not, well, you yeah. can't sustain well, that's it. Well, the other it's thing is like, you're just going to get, you're just going to be getting paid and you're going to bounce around between different colleges to get the money that you're looking for yeah. and at the same time you're not really earning an education like don't get me wrong i think the college athlete is special and i think what they're able to do on a football field is is incredibly dynamic but it's not dynamic to the point where you're going to be making more money than you and i have made yeah. in the last 10 years yeah. just because you can throw a football 60 yards and you're not even playing right and thanks to NIL, this really does kind of put a bow on a lot of schools. Uh, it really limits the amount of schools that can do this. Because according to the flow chart that we have here, if you want a top flight running back, your starting running back is going to make about 340K. Your starting number one wideout is going to make around 610K. Your off- one and offensive these are kids lineman, from like... These are kids from like Louisiana yeah. and like Kentucky where that could buy a lot more than just a house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the places where the quality of life isn't that great or where, you know, cost of living isn't that high, you can live very well. You absolutely can live very well. And if you couple that with the fact that the states with no state income tax shit like you were walking away you're walking away with a higher percentage of that right if i just don't know how you're going to get these players to how you're going to get them to listen to you how are you going to get them to play and they're making just as much money as their coaches right or like you said where's the com how is this competitive where uh, it's basically Notre Dame pockets against Clemson pockets against Alabama pockets, and oh yeah, and there's like TCU. Right. It's like, well, how's, huh. how's Boise State gonna like all it? It, re- they, it repositions the mid majors. Everything that was done by the BCS, right? Bringing the bubble up of Boise State, the you know the UCFs, all all of that is for naught. Cincinnati. Cincinnati's never going to sniff the system, right? They're never going to sniff the nope. playoff under the system. They they can't afford no. that. Yeah, they're a Division One school, but that's not going to happen. James Madison, it, you know, James Madison had a nice run last year. Was James is James Madison going to be able to afford this? Probably not. Now, you know, eventually this is going to implode on itself. It's a matter of time because. Eventually, donors are going to stop paying. It's going to get to the point where they're going to spend millions upon millions of dollars and be like, what the hell have I spent on? Where is my return? I don't know, man. Where's the I, think, return I, think some of the, I think some of these guys have so much money that it's it's like a it's more of a pride thing than anything. It's like, oh, I paid for that guy to come here. That's my player. Like... <laughs> And, and granted, yeah, they might not win the national championship, but they're gonna win. They're gonna win bowl games. They're gonna they're gonna beat their rival. They'll beat the win the rivalry. 
whatever that is. Like, if you're Ohio State, you beat Michigan. If you're Notre Dame, you beat USC. It's like shit like that. Right. They'll get off on that. Like, you know, when you're... That's the whole thing is that some of these boosters have so much money that $10 million, $5 million, it ain't nothing to them. It's nothing. They're going to get to go to the game. They're going to be able to say, that's my guy. Everyone's going to high-five them, handshake them, handshake them. Their, their, maybe their player goes on to win the Heisman or maybe their player goes on to do really good things. It's crazy. It's just crazy talk. Like I would never, I would, that's how much money you got when you're spending money on pl- college players yeah. to go to your school. But there's a lot of famous alumni th- out there. You know, we even had Charles Barkley saying how he tried to recruit Dirk to go to Auburn, you know? Mm. So and then you get the players Then you get the players trying to recruit guys to go to their school. Like this thing is endless. It's bottomless. Do you think it's going to slow down? It's going to get worse. I think it's going to get a lot worse. It's definitely going to get a lot worse before that it gets any better. And now you have the NFL floating this idea where companies are going to be able to buy stakes in teams. What the fuck is that going to do to the leak? That's wild shit. It's just uh, freaking... It's the, the cash flow going into sports is just astronomical. Pigs get fog. Wait, pigs, pigs get fat. Hog gets slaughtered. It's the way it always is. And their day is coming. I mean, we're going to see it over the next five years, how much of a watered-down product college football is going to be. We're getting to see it right now with Florida State, who's booty. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, Ujulele, he tanked Clemson. Now he's tanking Florida State. Where is he going to go next year? He's not going to go to the NFL. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Maybe he'll join a spelling contest. I don't know. know. Good luck. (laughs) Spell your own last name, kid. Spell your own last name. Step outside of your safe area and make a statement without saying much. With FCK Clout Lifestyle Apparel. Embrace the colorful chaos and stay emotionally regulated in their graphic tees, hoodies, snapbacks, accessories, and more. Go to fckclout.com today and check out current season and past season merchandise for men and women. Get it while you can. That's fckclout.com. Check them out today. fckclout.com. But uh, going over to the diamond, and speaking of kids, the calendar has turned to, Dece- uh, to September, which means oh, MLB roster expansion. A notable player remaining in the minors as of right now is Yankee outfielder Jason Dominguez. The Martian is being passed over in favor of playing Alex Verdugo, keeping Trent Grisham and Duke Ellis around. Who? Who? Is this purely service time manipulation or something more? I think it's the Yankees just fucking up his career, <laughs> right? They just do a great job of doing that, right? I mean, look at Clint Frazier and how they ruined that poor kid's <laughs> fucking career. He's about to be the next Glenn Frazier. Like, if you're not going to play him, fucking trade him. Like, get rid of him. Like, he's been ready. He was ready two years ago. The fact that he's still down there. I've been talking about this guy's rookie card for, like, the last three years. And he can't get up here and play enough. It's just like, how much longer are you waiting for this whole dream roster to come to fruition? Like, let's go already. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand it either. Now, he is, he's still young. Like, he's a kid. But last year, I mean, he didn't really show you that much. 229, four homers, seven ribbies, and 30, 35 bombs, at bats, man. right? So, he had some bombs. Eight hits, four of them were homers. That's impressive. The rest of it, not so much. Like, he's got a lot to, he's got a lot to work on. And,. I understand the Yankee fans are starving for this kid to be up there because Alex Verdugo is such ass right now. But Alex Verdugo is going to probably give you more competitive at bats during the playoffs than Jason Dominguez will. We saw Jason. I don't know about that. We saw Jason Dominguez in his one game up here, and he looked completely overmatched. So. Yeah, but give him a chance. You're not giving him a chance. He looked overmatched. He, he's not playing every day. Let, let him come up here and play every day. He's more talented than Alex Verdugo. The, the, the kid down the block who's 13 years old is better than fucking Alex Verdugo at this point. What was he batting? 223? 
He's in, he's in the low 200s. Yeah, yeah, he's trash. He's booty. That's why Boston was like, yeah, take him. Good luck. Yeah. Well, the real thing, the real issue here is that they have their replacement for Juan Soto. When he inevitably leaves because the Yankees aren't going to pay him $700 million. <laughs> right? Hey, what's it going to cost? What's it going to cost? For Soto? It's going to cost yeah. 13 years, yeah. $750 million, right? It's tough because... You know, he doesn't pitch. I understand why Otani got that contract because he's a two-way player. Like, Soho, Soto is like 650. Like, I, I mean, he it's high. 13 years? Yeah, it's high, dude. He's only 25. Like, that's the, that's the scary part about this is that it's going right. to cost you a shit ton of money and a shit ton of years. You're probably looking at right. a similar structure to a Bryce Harper contract where he's not getting a, a no trade. Like you're stuck with him for 13 years as he as he inevitably declines, and he probably ends up at first base, and probably is a hell of a first baseman. But you know, that's the that's gonna. But you still have four. You still have four years of prime soda. Yes, you're still. That, that's where he's gonna earn his money. But that's where the Yankees are gonna be like, hey, we tried. Oh, but we got Dominguez, he, the guy you wanted. He's here, and then something will happen. Right, you you invoked Clint Frazier before. You're not wrong. They gave Clint Frazier the keys to the kingdom, and he was done. Right <laughs> between the injuries and the lack of production, they he didn't live up to his end of the bargain. But they did not help that kid at all, and they're they're running up against it with Jason Dominguez too. They aren't, they're absolutely doing that. And to use Alex Verdugo as an excuse and to use Trent Grisham as an excuse. And who the fuck is Duke Ellis? That they got him to be a pinch runner? But you're, you know, okay, that's fine. But you're, you're telling me that, that that's it? Like, that those are the guys? Really? Okay. Okay. But... You know, it's it's absolutely ridiculous to think that that's what's standing in his way. So it feels it feels very much like service time manipulation because the longer he's down there, the longer you have control of him. And the downside of that is that the longer he's down there, the longer teams have to look at him, and the longer he's gonna languish right because well they're trying to say unpopular. that it, well they're trying they're trying to say that at least down there he's gonna play every day but dude he can fucking play every day right now like what are you talking not about? for long the seasons i mean the triple a season's not gonna it's gonna end soon it's you know you probably got a, like another few weeks left so what are we really freaking talking about here like he's going to provide you with a switch hitter. He's, he's a switch hitter. He's got pop. He's got an arm. He's got what you need. He's the shot in the a potential shot in the arm. He is the potential shot in the arm. But I don't know. We're, we're definitely like we're in that prospect hugging portion of the show with Brian Cashman. Right. He he hug, he hugs prospects. It's who he is. Is it going to get him fired? No, it's not going to get him fired. No. No, no, no. They're in first place. They're in first place. What do you, as a Met, as a Met fan, how much do you want to see Uncle Steve pony up for Soto? What's the number Ooh. that he, what's the number in the years that he offers where you say, okay, we got him. I'm good. Or it's like, you know what? We didn't get him, but we did offer this and I can't be mad at that. If you're in the t- the twelve the ten to twelve year range, like six hundred, like, you can't be mad at that offer, right? If you mm. if you went into negotiations with Juan Soto with his with the offer that the Nationals gave him the week before they decided to trade him, which was around three hundred seventy five million, yeah, that that's laughably low. But if you double that number. Like maybe you're in the ballpark and maybe that actually gets you that lands your fish. But if you're in the 10 to 12 year range, maybe with an option, maybe a limited no trade, a couple opt outs, something like, you know, 
some, some level of protection in case he's a bust or he just wants to possibly outplay his contract and get even more money. So like, I'm looking at 10, 12 years. If six, yeah, I would say 600 would be more than okay. enough just because he doesn't pitch. What about you? What, what, what would you, if, you know, put your, put your cap on. You're the man, you're the GM of the Braves. You, you could possibly pair him with Acuna. Like what would the, what would get that done for you? Uh, I can't afford him. <laughs> <laughs> I can't afford him. No, he can't, he can't afford him because he's so fucking good. Like he's so good. Um, and I do think that's what it's going to take. I think it's going to take 13 years, $750 million. That's what it's going to cost. That's the starting number. And I think your boy, Steve-O, he's going to be like, sure, done. Blank check. <laughs> what, what do you want? Sure. Be welcome to the Nets. Like, I really do. So I think it's just going to come down to him. It's going to come down to Soto. And if he wants to be a Met. Or if he wants to be a Yankee, or if he wants to be a Dodger, because the Mets are going to offer him the most money. Hands down, they're going to offer him the most money because Steve don't give a fuck, right? Right. And then the Yankees can't offer him the most money, but they're going to offer him. You're going to be playing with Judge, right? In the Bronx, we're going to win at least two. Like that's how they pitch it, right? right? But then it's like, wait a minute, like you could also go to the Dodgers and play with that fucking loaded team still not make as much money but now you're in LA playing with Betts Otani Freeman uh yeah how would you how (laughs) would you like to be Kevin Durant how would would you like to be Kevin Durant here well they haven't won yet that is although those guys haven't won well no they didn't but and then you could. I then there's some, but there's. I mean, I don't think it. I don't think there's any truth to these stories. But there's where the Nationals want it. No Nationals fucking way. Have, but they have a great argument. Z, they had a great argument. We traded you, and we got three baseball players, like really good baseball players. You're gonna come here, and these three guys are gonna develop with you. They. Eh. He liked it. He liked it playing for the Nationals. He won with the Nationals. Yeah. He was sad to leave there. So if they come close, that might also be an option for him. It's a place that loves him. He he holds all he holds all the cards. It's it's his world. And whatever he wants to do. So let me flip it to you though. What if you were him? What would you want if you were him? What would you want to do? You want to become? You want to be the Mets guy? You want to? You want to be the highest paid player? And you want to be the highest paid player in professional baseball and be the Mets guy? Do you want to stay in the Bronx and win at least two championships with Aaron Judge and and live and live the, live the life of luxury as a New York Yankee? You want to go West Coast and play with Otani, Freeman, and Betts on a team that's already won a World Series? Or do you want to go home? You want to go back to the Nationals, the team that drafted you, the team you won with, and try to and enjoy playing baseball there. What would you want to do if you were him? Uh, as sentimental as it would be to go back to the Nationals, I don't think their pockets are deep enough. I really do. For, for you. For me. Because they for need you. to. Like, they, they, They're like, we give you 10 years, 500 mil. That's cool, but and you're like, who else is here? You're like, no, there's nobody else here. Like, I get that C.J. Abrams is there. I get that James Wood is there. But James Woods is good, man. He's good. He's really but good. But you know what? That's not a ready-made team yet. And I'm taking up. No, they yeah, And I'm taking up the lion's share of the money. That becomes a problem. <laughs> so, Nats are out. Now, on the flip side of that, the Dodgers have all the fucking money in the world, and they know how to spend it. But I don't want to be the fifth option. I don't want to be fucking Kevin Durant. Like, I want to be the guy. Like, I am the guy. Just, I want to be paid like the guy, and I want to be treated like the guy. So, to me, like, I I don't see him going to the Dodgers, because he's like the fifth wheel. 
He mm. is. So that becomes is very interesting. You have the Yankees and you have the Mets. He doesn't outshine Aaron Judge. But it's, it's Aaron Judge's team. Right? Much in the way that Alex Rodriguez could never outshine Derek Jeter. It was Derek Jeter's team. Regardless of whatever personal accolades Alex Rodriguez put up, it was always Derek Jeter's team, and that never changed. I think that there's a better chance of it become or the Mets becoming Soto's team with the blessing of Francisco Lindor. Then what about Pete? Pete's gone, man. If you you're signing one or the other, you can't afford both. Because you got to pay Nemo, you got to pay Pete, you got to. There's a lot of guys on this team, and Uncle Stevie's got deep pockets. He doesn't have that deep of a pocket. Like nobody, mm. like it's it's not college football. He doesn't have that deep of a pocket. So that's going to require a little bit of a sacrifice, and the polar bear is probably the guy who's going to get sacrificed. But who can who can afford me? Who's willing to pay me the most money at that point? I don't think that Steve Cohen is going to be denied. I really don't. I, I, I really don't think so. Right? Like, this isn't a situation like when he came into this league and he just, like, puffed his chest out. I'm, like, I'm going to get the best of everybody. And then everybody stonewalled him. But you can't do that with a free agent. Right? So, Juan Soto likes New York. Clearly, he likes New York. He likes money. <laughs> he, likes, he likes those two things. Who can give him the most? The Mets. The Mets can obviously can absolutely give him the most. The Yankees will give him the experience. The Mets will give him the money. Ultimately, I think he's going to choose the Mets. I think you're right. I, I, I think that he's going to take that money and just take it to the bank. And I don't know how many championships that necessarily delivers. Because these huge overpays aren't exactly delivering championships lately. So, I mean, it remains to be seen. But then Jason Dominguez will get to play. So, that's awesome, I guess. Congratulations, Martian. When owning a home, it's important to have heating and cooling professional available when things go wrong. Air Care Technicians is a veteran-owned HVAC company servicing the Westchester area. They are licensed to service, repair, maintenance, and replace all HVAC units. If your unit is not running properly or you would like to improve the air quality in your home, contact Air Care Technicians for a free quote. They offer same-day and emergency services for all of your needs. You can reach them at 914-315-1500. Air Care Technicians, 914-315-1547. The Wheel Route. The wheel is ready. Are you ready? We are going to be spinning for NFL Awards. You ready, D? Ready. All right. Who is going to be the NFL MVP? I am going with Stroud. I think he has a phenomenal season. I think he doesn't have a sophomore slump. I think he gets his team to the AFC Championship game. Ultimately loses to Patrick Mahomes, but I think it's a quarterback award. I can't imagine any other quarterback getting it. It is quarterback award. You're absolutely right. Uh, The top three I had written down, Mahomes, Jared Goff, C.J. Stroud. Now, you can give Mahomes the award every year in the same way that you can give LeBron the NBA NBA MVP. LeBron. LeBron. You absolutely could do that if you were so inclined. I think this is the year. I said I was very bullish on Jared Goff. 
and I think this is the year he lights it up. Majority of his games are in a dome. He plays very well in a controlled environment. That team has something to prove. Jamison Williams has a chip on his shoulder. I think that Jared Goff is going to be your NFL MVP. Not only that, I think Jared Goff is going to lead the league in passing. There you go. You heard it here first. That that Lions offense is just waiting to explode. They have unfinished business. They're hungry. They're pissed off. And it's going to come from the top down. Right? It comes from Dan Campbell to Jared Goff. And Jared Goff is going to take it out on everybody this season. All right. Spin it again. Who are the NFL rookies of the year? Well, I know you're down on it, but I've got Caleb Williams winning the offensive rookie of the year. And for defensive rookie of the year, I'm going with Chop Robinson, offensive, I mean, defensive linebacker on the Miami Dolphins. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I get the Caleb Williams, I get the wanting it to happen. I really do. Yeah. I, I understand that. But he's got to make it happen. Oof. So that that really... That, that I'm not sold. I'm just, I'm just not sold. I don't think it's... This one isn't a quarterback award. Right? It doesn't necessarily mm. have to be a quarterback award. Yeah, you're going to have right. Bo Nix, Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams. I don't think it's necessarily... I, I don't think it's... it's uh, a fait accompli that a quarterback wins this. Give me Xavier Worthy from the Chiefs. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you put him. Do you have to have double digit touchdowns for that to happen? It's possible. If you have Patrick Mahomes throwing you the ball, a lot of things are possible. Right? Who would you rather have throwing you the ball? Patrick Mahomes or Kyler Murray? Patrick. Patrick. Yeah, exactly. Even though Marvin Harrison is going to get a lion's share of the targets, I think Xavier Worthy is going to be in a better position. So, give me Worthy for that. And I like Dallas Turner from the Vikings. Solid uh, outside linebacker, speed, length, flexibility. He's got a shot to be special, right? So, we'll see. And... He's going to get plenty of opportunity with the Vikings since there's really not a lot going on there. So he has, <laughs> he has a chance. He has a chance to be a game breaker very early on in his career. All right. Spin this thing one more time. Who is your NFL coach of the year? I'm going to go with Mike McDonald of the wow. Seattle Seahawks. I I think he gets that defense playing. They drafted that nose tackle out of, I think, Texas A&M. And I think he's going to be able to meet you. Yeah. Oh, he came from Texas. Byron Murphy. Mm-hmm. And I just think that they're going to they're gonna fly around on defense. I mean, he coached the Ravens the last couple of years. And he always had them playing at a high level. And I think he brings the 12th man. And uh, I think he wins it. Wow, that's an outside-the-box choice. Uh, that's, that's, Thank you. That's a good one. That's a really good that's one. I do. It's what you do. That's yeah. what I do. Well, never mind, he's a former Raven. But, you know, you know that's fine. We'll go with that. Um, I didn't even notice. Yeah. I got to I gotta say, like, who's going to be the D'Amico Ryans this year, right? Who's going to be that guy? Who's going to take that team that's improbable? Very well. It could be McDonald. It could be. Yeah, I got it. I like Dan Campbell. I, I really think that he's going to learn from his mistakes. Dano. Dan Balls Campbell. So there you go. The Danimal. Campbell. I think that he's got something to prove. Right, he's got a chip on his shoulder because he was being questioned last year about his decision making, and I think he's going to stick it up everybody. 
I, I think that they're on a mission. And I don't think you can deny the Lions of that mission. So, yeah. It's a two-horse race, in my opinion. You know, D'Amico Ryans or Dan Campbell. Now, D'Amico Ryans, you know, did win it last year. So, you know, there's not much in the way of uh, surprise. So, give me the guy who's going to have the, have his team humming on all cylinders. I'm going to take Dan Campbell on this one. But if you're looking for, like, an outside-the-box kind of guy... If the Broncos are any good, Sean Payton might get a get a look. If the Broncos are any any good, any good at all. So, I mean, that's a hell of a reclamation project. If he's able to do anything with that roster. But give me the guy who's poised and ready to go. Give me Dan Balls Campbell as coach of the year. <laughs> Your favorite podcast has its own merch line now. Go to the Fade Store with DNZ.com today and check out our releases in apparel, accessories, drinkware, and more. Ever wanted an alleged superstar t-shirt? We got those. You want some yoga pants? We got those too. And we're not done yet. We have a lot of exciting collaborations and new products on the way. But check out what we have now at the Fade Store with DNZ.com. That's the Fade Store with DNZ. Who is the best of the worst this week in sports? The Fade Store presents the Alleged Superstar of the Week Award. All right, boys and girls, you know what time it is. It's time for the Alleged Superstar of the Week. You know how it goes. We put up a poll on our X account at FaderoutDNZ and our Instagram poll at FaderoutPodcast. And you vote, and you vote, and you vote, and you vote. And the winner of said vote gets a shout-out on this tier show and takes on the coveted-ass trophy. And do you know who took on the coveted-ass trophy last week, D? I don't. The Born Texas Little League coach. Can't be getting kids hurt. You just can't be doing that. Absolutely not. Kid says you're hurt. he's hurt. You take him out. No questions asked. But that was last week. This is this week. Who are your nominees for Alleged Superstar of the Week? D. All right. So first up, I've got Florida State. Oof. Oof. Better known as Booty. <laughs> Opening up against Georgia Tech, they lose 24-21. Then this past Sunday, they lost 28-13 to Boston College. The ACC's a joke. Florida State's booty. Florida State, you are my alleged superstar of the week. Number two, I'm going to go with the 49ers. Brandon Ayuk held out, cried, whined, didn't practice, got his deal. Trent Williams held out, cried, whined. Guess what? He got his deal. 49ers are setting a bad precedent for getting your deals. Hassan Reddick, hang in there. Yours is coming. 49ers, you are my alleged superstar of the week. And number three, I'm going with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Starting Russell Wilson over Justin Fields and then naming Russell Wilson the starter? This is something that took you all week to name, and he not only becomes the starter, but then he's a captain? He just, he's been there for five minutes, and he's the captain? Not only will he start less than ten games, but then he's not even coming back next year, so your captain is going to be a backup quarterback this year. Mike Tomlin, you're better than that. Pittsburgh Steelers, you are my alleged superstar of the week. What do you got? Son Reddick might get that deal from the Niners if the Jets are uh, the Jets are smart. That would be ha, ha, that would be great. Maybe a third round pick. You know, send him out to San Francisco. Call it a day. They're gonna wait until after the game. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. They traded him there before the game, and he just like tears it up that first game. We had to remove Aaron Rodgers from the turf with a spatula. And now we just sent Hassan Reddick to the San Francisco 49ers. We wish you well in your future endeavors. The 49ers should just call just to break their balls this week. That's why I could never be a GM because I'd be like, hey, what do you guys want for Hassan Reddick? I'll offer you a one. <laughs> just, so they, just so they have to say no. Fuck you, man. Because they can't fucking trade him. They'll just hang up on me. It's like, 
John Lynch, line one. <laughs> hey, John. Hey there, Joe. What do you want for Reddick? Nothing. He's all I'll give you. A, I'll give you a one. I'll give you a one and a two. <laughs> He's our guy. <laughs> Are you go- Where is he, Joe? Is he even in the state of Jersey? He might be. I don't. He's from Jersey. I, I don't know. Oh my god, this is a fucking See, shit show. Your Mets are jacking this game up right now. <laughs> Base is loaded. No goddamn out. shit show. <laughs> goddamn shit show. Well, my first alleged superstar nominee is Yulia Putinsteva. That yep. guy, French, uh, excuse me, Russian tennis player at the U.S. Open. Not exactly the best look out there. Unhappy with the ball girl. The ball girl bounces the balls to her. She just lets the balls bounce off of her. And it's just an absolute bullshit. Showing up some kid for what? It's so disrespectful that a person's doing their job, but you have such little respect for them that you're gonna just disregard them and just let the ball hit you and just move on it's just a joke like just be a professional whatever happened to being a professional Yulia Putinsteva you are my alleged superstar of the week number two the Pittsburgh Pirates moving O'Neill Cruz to center field despite having never played there. Never. Never, ever. Now, the kid's got a cannon. Goes over, routinely over 100 miles an hour. The problem is, is that usually it's past the defender at first base, or like in the dirt, or some, who knows where the fuck it's going. Usually it's past the first baseman, against the, against the screen, and just, he's... He's not quite a butcher because Ellie De La Cruz has more errors than him, but it's close. My problem with the Pirates is why are you doing it now? You probably should have done it sooner. Or you wait until the offseason. Just way to, way to throw in... Throw in... Does the playing out feel hard? It's not no. hard. Tell him why. It's very it's hard. hard. It's very hard. <laughs> It's it's absolutely and center field of all positions, right? It's not like you stick him in the corner, you know. You, there's a lot more range there. There's a lot more nuance to playing center field. Like Jazz Chisholm learned eventually, but it took him time and reps. And, and not this is this is not going to end well for Mister Cruz. Pittsburgh Pirates, you are my alleged superstar of the week. Hey, here's a radical idea for O'Neill Cruz. They mentioned on PTI, and I think they're right. If he throws 100 miles an hour, put him on the fucking mound. Oh my god, how about that? Better teach this kid some control before he kills somebody. (laughs) And then, number three, Ted Uncle. Who? Ted Uncle is an MLS official. And he was refing the NYCFC Columbus Crew match this weekend. And in a pivotal in a pivotal moment in this game, he essentially set a pick against Julian Fernandez of NYCFC, resulting in ultimately the game winning the the game winning goal. So there's that. And then on top of that, when Julian Fernandez tried to move Ted Uncle out of the way or try and get around Ted Uncle and accidentally put his hands on him, he was given a secret red card. To the point where the broadcast team on Apple TV acknowledged they were playing with 10 men. No announcement was ever made. No graphic was shown. Nothing. Just like, oh, NYCFC showing a lot of heart, playing a man down. Like, what? When that happened? Who got kicked out of the game? What the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) All because Ted Uncle is a clueless putz. Ted Uncle, don't play favorites. You kind of can't do that and be an official. Ted Uncle, you 
are my alleged superstar of the week. I think we said our piece. Go to our X account at FaderoutDNZ and our Instagram poll at FaderoutPodcast and vote and vote and vote and vote. And for our nominees. You're better than that. Just do better. Just do better. This has been the Fade Route with DNZ. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Catch our podcast on Wednesday nights on Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to your podcast. So until next time, stay fade, everyone. Time for us to run the go route. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of our podcast. If you liked what you heard and you want to hear more, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Leave us a review, rate us five stars, turn on subscription notifications, and share on social media. Tell your friends and spread the word.